can I have your attention? Let's welcome today's speaker to the War and Peace Lecture Series. Lynn Kaminsky comes to us from the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And she works with NASA and she works with local educational grants to make sure that people are getting good education in this area because we want them to be well educated for the 21st century. She's been a lecturer for us ever since I've been involved with this program, so that's at least 10 years, I would say maybe, something like that. And uh, we're delighted to have her once again. I want to remind everybody, I see some people who are not students in the audience. That's fantastic. We really want to welcome you. And if you want to follow us on Facebook, you can do that. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. However, stay in touch. We're using a lot more social media thanks to our intern, Caitlin, here. And with that being said, please welcome Lynn Kaminsky to the lecture series tonight. Okay, well, this talk has a new title this year, so those of you who are faculty who have seen it before, it's going to be a little different. First, for the students who've never seen any of my talks before, so it'll be totally different. Um, so the, the, this year's title, I used to always call the talk Physics of Weapons of Mass Destruction, and I guess that just got to be a little too depressing. So um, this year it's a suggestion from Tim here, Science of War and Peace. So. We're going to have a little slightly different slant on the subject. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about some different sides of science, and then I'm going to go through a bit about the uses of atoms for war, including some history, fission and fusion weapons, and the effects of nuclear weapons. And then I'm going to talk about atoms for peace, and talk about some of the current events that are going on um, in the world right now, in particular with a focus on what's happening with Iran. And so every year I try to pick something that's in the news that has to do with the subject and give you extra information about that. Well, this year there's just so much going on in the world it was really hard to figure out what I should actually focus on. And so I decided um, I would pick on, on the stuff that's going on with Iran and hopefully you'll understand why. And also Tim asked me to mention to you that um, for those of you who have hundreds of cable channels like I do, and I actually can't remember what channel it's on, there's a show called Manhattan that's been on. It's about the Manhattan Project. It's actually pretty good. Um, a lot of the main characters are composites of real scientists, but they have some of the real people in there too, like Leslie Groves and Robert Oppenheimer and people like that. So um, it's up to about episode 10, and I have no idea whether it's available on demand on some internet site, but. It's called Manhattan, like the Manhattan Project, so you might be interested in checking that out. Okay, well, here's a couple quotes to start you off about science. One from my, uh, one of my actual friends, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You may know him as the host of the Cosmos series. He also is the, uh, the head of astronomy at the museum in New York City. So the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe it. Whether or not you believe in it. Okay, so you don't have to believe in what I'm saying today, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm going to actually explain to you how things work, and it really is the way that they work. And then a quote by, by J. Robert Oppenheimer, of course, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, it's just sort of explaining how scientists think about exciting projects that they get involved in. They're not really making moral judgments at the time. Right? You just see something and it's just really interesting intellectually and technically, and so you go ahead and do it, and you only stop and think about what to do with it later after it's, you've seen whether the thing is going to actually work out the way you planned. And so, you know, that was the way it was with that project and with the development of the atomic bomb. They, they thought they were going to eventually make a bomb, but they really, all the scientists were most attracted to working on it because it was something that was just really intellectually challenging and something they were really trying to understand about the way atoms were put together. Okay, so science really doesn't discriminate between war and peace. And here's just a little table that I put together of something that's used for war in one column and the subject of science that it comes from. Right, so for chemistry, you can have chemical weapons and the same kind of techniques also make the pharmaceutical industry. Right, so it's a lot of the same stuff. Uh, chemical explosives, you know, regular TNT kind of things, well, that can be used to demolish buildings or 
make holes in places that you want to put a new building. With biology, for example, you have biological weapons. Well, one of the, one of the um, most dangerous ones is the same um, botulinum toxin that makes Botox, which is like a cosmetic surgery thing. I haven't used it myself personally. Um, but also vaccines, right? Vaccines are, are something that's derived from the science of biological weapons. Now, I'm not going to talk about any of this stuff in black because I don't have time. But I'm going to talk about the things that are in red here, and in particular, nuclear weapons and the peaceful side of that, nuclear power. Okay, you have lots of sensors, for example, on spy satellites. Well, almost all those sensors are used in astronomy. And that's a field that I actually do get paid to work on. Um, guidance systems for missiles, right? Same technology is turned into the GPS that everybody loves to use on their cell phones. I mean, I can't even find my way around anywhere these days without using GPS in my car or like going around someplace I've never been. Um, ballistics, right? So sending up missiles and trying to aim, aim them at things. Well, this is actually one of my hobbies, you know, actually launching rockets with experimental payloads on them. I just, a couple of weeks ago, was out at Black Rock the week after all the burners left and was launching rockets with my rocket club with payloads that we're developing for teachers. It was really fun, especially because there's nobody there with the rocket club. Um, strategic defense, and so that means the thing that used to be called Star Wars, where we're going to try to intercept the missiles that somebody else is shooting at us. Well, that uses lasers for the most part, right? Lasers are ubiquitous in modern, modern society. Besides this pointer in my hand, you've got the scanners at the checkout registers, right? You've got all sorts of lasers everywhere. So there's, you know, there's, there's a flip side to all of these technologies. When it comes to computers, you've got cryptography, but then a lot of that, a lot of the mathematics and the techniques for that are behind the encryption security that you use whenever you go to like HTTPS. Right? So a protected website. They're using the same kind of encryption algorithms, but more complicated slightly for the purposes of national defense. Um, you've got spy satellites, right, that are looking at what the other countries are doing. On the other hand, you've also got satellites up there that are imaging the Earth to look at what's happening with vegetation, what's happening with water, what's happening with the demolition of the rainforests. Okay, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about um, a little bit later is the whole issue of cybersecurity and, and secure websites, which is sort of related to the whole cryptography thing. Maybe those shouldn't have been separate. Okay, so there's, there's different sides to everything. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk about atoms for war and share with you a little bit of the history. So, right around the time of World War II, so we're talking about the late 1930s, early 1940s, physicists just coincidentally at that time were just beginning to understand how atoms actually work and how you could extract energy from atoms. And they realized that it would be possible to release huge amounts of energy by either breaking the atoms apart or smashing the atoms together, and in particular the nuclei of the atoms far more energy than you can get out of chemical reactions in which just the electrons are moving back and forth. And so what would Einstein do? Well, by, many, by 1939, many of the prominent, and most of these physicists were actually Jewish that were working in Europe on these problems. They had left Europe and they had moved to the USA for obvious reasons. But Einstein signed a letter to President Roosevelt and told him of the potential of creating nuclear reactions that could be used inside of weapons. But, you know, having been warned in 1939, we weren't part of the war yet, no big deal, you know, it's just the letter probably just got put aside and it was like, well, okay, he's worried, but so what? But then when Pearl Harbor happened, um, the U.S. decided this is something we better look into. And so they created the Manhattan Project, and I think you've been watching a little bit of the day after Trinity, so you should have learned a little bit about the Manhattan Project by now. And this race began between the remaining German physicists that weren't Jewish, that stayed in Germany, and all of the ones that had come and emigrated to the United States to try to figure out exactly how, how to build these nuclear weapons and how to harness this power of the atom. 
So despite its name, the Manhattan Project was really in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And most of the funding for this project went to, to build the factories to actually make the materials that you needed to make the bombs out of. Because they don't exist in nature. Um, you can't just pick up a rock out of the ground and put it in a bomb and try to get it to explode. And as you may have gotten to this part of the movie, the first successful uh, weapons test was called Trinity. And it was in 1945 in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Okay, so what's the difference between nuclear physics and chemistry? This is a diagram of a helium atom. There's two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus and two electrons going around the outside. If you're looking at a chemistry reaction, like you might have taken in a chemistry class here at Sonoma State, who's, who's taken chemistry? Okay, so when you're doing chemistry reactions, you're basically manipulating these electrons. They're going from this atom to some other atom. Well, maybe not this one, but from one atom to another atom. And the typical energies involved are the order of a few electron volts. Okay, it's about the same amount of energy that you get for each light ray of visible light that goes into your eye. A few electron volts. On the other hand, with nuclear physics, what you're doing is you're manipulating what's going on in the nucleus here. So you're changing the number of protons or neutrons in the nucleus, you're breaking up nuclei, you're smashing them together, and in this case, the typical energies that you get are millions of times more energetic per reaction compared to chemistry. That's why you take chemistry here at Cinema State and not a class in nuclear physics or nuclear weapon making. A long time ago we had a class in nuclear physics, but we haven't had one for a while. Okay, so millions of times more energy per reaction. So let's just start with uranium. This is just a bar of uranium. It's an inch long. It weighs 10 grams. That's a third of an ounce, roughly. If you were to go get a rock out of the ground that had uranium in it, it would be uranium-238. This is the weight of it. This is the number of total protons plus neutrons. So for it to be the element uranium, it has 92 protons, and so everything 238 minus 92 is the number of neutrons, 146. Well, it's a radioactive substance. It has a half-life of about 10 billion years, but it isn't something you can readily make a weapon out of because it can't sustain a chain reaction, and it doesn't release very much energy in each one of its radioactive decays. On the other hand, if you go to this isotope of uranium, so it's still got 92 protons, but now it has only 143 neutrons, this is less than 0.7%, so less than 1% of you would find in the rock would be in this naturally occurring form. Um, if you could make more of this, compared to this, you could actually sustain a chain reaction that you need to make a weapon out of. Okay, so uranium-235, which does occur naturally, and it's the only substance that does occur naturally that can be used in, in weapons, um, fission weapons, is the thing that people need to get more of if you want to actually build a bomb or a power plant, as it turns out. Okay, so with a fission weapon, what you have is a neutron, a fast neutron, going and smashing into this nucleus of this uranium-235, and then it breaks into all sorts of pieces. And when it does that, it releases tremendous amounts of energy, millions of electron volts worth of energy for each reaction. This also works if you were to use plutonium. Okay, but plutonium is a man-made substance that doesn't occur in rocks in the ground. So you can make plutonium in nuclear reactors, but you can't just go mine it out of the ground. Okay, and so fission reactions like this are what are, is at the heart of an atomic bomb or an A-bomb. So you break, you're fizzing the nucleus, you are splitting the nucleus by ramming it with a fast neutron. <coughs> and so the first atomic bombs were Trinity, as we've mentioned, also called Gadget, had the equivalent yield of about 20,000 tons, 20 kilotons, of a chemical explosive like TNT, like dynamite. Okay, so the next one, the one that the US dropped on Hiroshima, was uh, called Little Boy. 
And the one after that that was dropped in Nagasaki was called Fat Man. These also had, you know, 15, 20,000 ton equivalent yield. There's a museum display from New Mexico. There's Fat Man and there's Little Boy. Okay, so how did you, how did they actually make Little Boy? It's actually a gun style uh, explosive. Actually, Trinity and Fat Man were implosion style explosives. This one is a gun barrel style explosive. And so, first of all, you have to go from less than 1% in nature to more than 90% of that isotope of uranium-235. So most of the factories that they were building to support the Manhattan Project, they were working on trying to get the uranium isotope up to this level of the, what is called highly enriched uranium or weapons grade uranium. Okay, so it's enriched in the isotope 235, which means it's depleted in the isotope 238, which is the common one that's in the rocks that you mine up the ground. You've got to squeeze and confine all the material. You've got to hit it with some neutrons to start with, and it takes a bomb to make a bomb. So you've got to start with a chemical explosive, which in this case takes some uranium-235 down there, squeeze it into the other uranium-235 that's at the other end of the gun barrel, you then achieve critical mass, you hit it with a bunch of neutrons, and the whole thing goes boom. So that was the theory of that one. And just to make sure that they could make more than one kind, the Trinity one and the Fat Man one were spherical, right? Fat Man was a spherical looking thing, it didn't look like a long skinny gun barrel. Um, you put the chemical explosive around the outside, of the uranium-235, and you manage to set all of this off at the same time so it squeezes it really evenly from all sides in a sphere so that you get your critical density of your fissile material. And then when that happens, you hit it with a blast of neutrons right at the same time. So, and then you get, you get your big explosion at that point. So those are the two styles. This is the physics behind how they work, not the engineering. The engineering is much, much more complicated. Um, I don't have a security clearance. I've learned everything I know about this from just publicly available books and websites. And you know, I started learning about it before there were websites, but you know what I mean, right? There's nothing that I can tell you. I don't know any secrets, so I can't, I'm not at risk of divulging any secrets to you, so I can talk about this stuff all I want. And it's sort of been my hobby for a large part of my life to educate people about nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons effects and technology. Um, because my PhD thesis was about nuclear explosions on the surfaces of neutron stars, which are collapsed cores of distant stars out there in the galaxy and in the cosmos. And so I learned a lot of the physics when I was studying for my PhD. And later, when I moved to California, I briefly considered working at the Livermore Lab, which is the local nuclear weapons lab. And they were going to pay me a lot of money. And I um, was happy to get another job offer where I could just keep doing astronomy and worry, worry about things that were exploding 15,000 light years away or 2 billion light years away and not things that were exploding on Earth. Wor worked well for me anyway. Okay, so fusion weapons, this is basically the kind of nuclear reactions that happen in the sun. Right, so in the center of our sun, there are all these nuclei that are being squished together, hydrogen nuclei, to make heavier elements. And the energy that comes out of that is what makes the sunshine. Eventually, all that energy comes out the surface of the sun, makes the sun glow at about 6,000 Kelvin, and makes the yellow thing that we like to draw pictures of. This is mostly yellowish visible light that comes out. And so fusion reactions, you start with lightweight elements, elements lighter than iron, and you somehow manage to squeeze them together to overcome the repulsion of the nuclei because they're both positively charged, so you've got to really squeeze them hard to get them to get over that. It's called Coulomb barrier. 
And uh, eventually, if you can do that in some way, the sun does it because it weighs a lot and it's got a lot of gravity from all that mass of the gas squeezing on the center of, it, of its core, but you can do it um, in other ways, magnetic fields or by exploding things and squeezing stuff together. And, uh, and so that's, those are H bonds, H like hydrogen, because it starts with hydrogen or isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium. And these are also thermonuclear reactions because the hotter <coughs> it gets, the faster the reactions run, then, then it gets hotter and then the reactions run even faster until you get your runaway situation there making a much more efficient bomb. Okay, so why is an atomic bomb so much worse than a chemical ex explosive bomb? Well, first, because of this huge difference in the energy per reaction, the amount of heat and light that you get out is at least a thousand times greater. But also, the explosion is accompanied by invisible, penetrating, and harmful radiation like x-rays and gamma rays and high energy charged particles, or high energy neutrons. After the explosion, this radioactive fallout, the radioactive fragments of the nuclei that blew up, all of those other things that, are, that came out of the reaction, they can stick to dust particles and continue to damage living things for a really long time. You know, days to weeks to, to years. And there's a little illustration of the the famous mushroom cloud. Okay, so you also have thermal effects. When you make a really big explosion in air, the explosion pushes all the air molecules out and makes a vacuum where it just happened and rams the air molecules into the ones that, that were right next to the edge there. It's called the shock wave. And so you get this big pressure shock wave going out um, you've also got the formation of the mushroom cloud. You've also got a huge amount of heat that makes a fireball. And then you can have firestorms. Let me just start this little video up of, of Trinity. I don't know, oh wait, that's where they have a light microphone now. This is so exciting. This is not your last year. Okay, so. There you see this hot ball of gas from where the explosion was. And because it's a hot ball of gas, it rises, right? Because hot air rises. And when it does that, this vac evacuated area that's rising up makes a vacuum that sucks all the stuff up what is the stem of the mushroom. Right, and then I'll just play that again. Let me find my mouse. Oh, there it is. Okay, so. So there's the big explosion. See, now it's, it's made this evacuated really hot area, millions of degrees hot. It's rising because it's, it's heated gas. It's actually less dense. And then all of the stuff on the ground sees this, feels this big vacuum, this big sucking. So it goes up the stem of the mushroom, right? All this dust and dirt, all of those radio Radioactive particles that were created by the fission fragments stick to that dust and dirt. The thing keeps rising and rising until the pressure inside that ball is the same as the pressure in the atmosphere, and then it spreads out and makes the mushroom shape. Does that make sense to everybody? If you, if you ever wondered where the mushroom shape comes from, that's where it comes from. Um, and then you also have this initial blast of radiation from all of the fission fragments and the gamma rays and other particles, neutrons, helium nuclei. This is a this is a creepy movie here with narration. Shadows of the posts on the opposite bridge indicate the direction of the explosion. Six tenths of a mile from zero point, the bridge floor is etched except for a shielded by the rail. Outlined in the surface of the bridge is the shadow of the pedestrian, which tells its own meaningful story. That is a vaporized person. That, that guy's drawing the shadow on. So anything that's too close gets 
immediately vaporized. Um, the posts left, the posts of the, of the bridge were left intact and they made shadows from where it was burned. Okay, so we talked about the pressure blast wave a little bit. So you've got this shock wave that forms at the edge of the big ball of hot gas moving out as the gas expands. That can knock down buildings. We talked about the radio radioactive fragments that get sucked up the mushroom stem. 80% falls back down in the first day, 90% falls back down in the first week. The other 10% circulates through the upper atmosphere and falls down over weeks to years. So if somehow you find yourself uh, in a place that was attacked by a nuclear weapon and you didn't get destroyed, you should stay in your house for a whole week and then after that maybe you can come out and live to tell the, live to tell the tale. If you want to see how far one bomb's effects can actually wreak havoc, try this nuclear weapons effect calculator on Google and you'll see you can pick your size bomb and pick your city and it'll show you the radii within which things get destroyed. Okay, and then last but not least, there's this thing called the electromagnetic pulse. So if you have a bomb that goes off really, really high in the air, well, let me turn the lights back on. Don't want y'all falling asleep on me. Then what happens is the gamma rays, the high energy radiation that comes off as part of the bomb, ionizes the air, at which point currents can flow through the air. And normally currents do not flow the air through the air, except like when you walk across the road and try to hit, you know, touch a doorknob, and you get a little bit of an electronic discharge, right, and you can shock yourself on the doorknob. Um, but normally air is not ionized. Well, of course, thunderstorms are another example. But in this case, you've got this huge region of ionized air, and so the currents that are flowing through the air can get picked up by power lines, go right down and destroy the entire grid and anything that's attached to it. Or anything that's not attached to it, because the whole air is ionized. So for example, when they were doing atmospheric testing in the 60s, there was a 1.4 million ton air burst that knocked out the lights in Hawaii over a thousand miles away. Due to these, this electromagnetic pulse, these currents going through the air. Here's a little diagram that shows like how high up the explosion would be and how how much of the US's power grid it would take out. Of course it assumes a <coughs> strong bomb as well. But you can read more about that. So it really only takes one well placed bomb that's not up too far to wipe out most of the electric grid in the entire country. Nevertheless we have thousands of them. Okay, so um Nuclear weapons are scary, right? I just told you a whole bunch of really gruesome stuff. Most of the lasting effects of the weapons are due to radiation, so they're odorless, they're colorless, you can't even tell that it's there unless you happen to walk around with a Geiger counter. Uh, if you have been blasted with a bunch of radiation, you probably won't die. If you don't die right away, you probably won't die for like 20 years until you develop some kind of cancer from the mutated cells. A uh, single bomb can kill 100,000 people, destroy an entire city, and those were the old-fashioned ones. And it doesn't take very much nuclear material to create a big explosion. Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki, those bombs were just a few kilograms of fissile material. You know, 10 pounds, like the size of a basketball at biggest, somewhere between a baseball and a basketball. On the other hand, it does take a lot of engineering to make bombs that really work. So it's not enough just to get your hands on the material, you have to have all the engineering that goes with it. How big are the weapons? Well, one kiloton, 1,000 tons, is, you know, a ton is 2,000 pounds, so that's 2 million pounds of TNT equivalent. And it takes about two pounds of uranium-235 to make a 20 kiloton weapon. Right? It'd be 20,000 tons of dynamite, two pounds of uranium-235. Gives you a feeling for the energy scales involved. Most of the warheads today are between 100 and 200 kilotons. Back when they were doing testing, the largest underground burst was four and a half million tons of explosive equivalent. 
The largest airburst was 58 megatons. And there were about 1,700 known tests since 1945 until the testing pretty much stopped about 10 years ago with an occasional test by other countries like North Korea. Okay, now, atoms for peace. Let's talk about something different. So that was my atoms for war section. Maybe I'll just stop for a second. Anybody have any questions about the atoms for war section? You're all so depressed, nobody wants to ask any questions, right? Oh, there's one. Are there any effects in Japan today? I know it's been a long time, but are there still any, uh, are there still any known um, incidents? Okay, so the, so the question is, are there any effects going on in Japan from the weapons that were <coughs> exploded there in the 1940s? I think there may still be a few people that were irradiated that, that are not dead yet, but um, mostly, you know, it was a long time ago. They've rebuilt those cities. Um, I think in Japan right now, they're more worried about Fukushima, <laughs> honestly. And I'm not talking about Fukushima this year. I did talk about it a couple years ago when that was the big thing that had happened, the nuclear reactor accident, Fukushima. So yeah, I think they're more worried about that because they've got a lot of contamination going on there now, and, and that's a pretty serious situation. Okay, so what was Adams for Peace? Well. It was mostly a publicity thing started by President Eisenhower. He started it in 1953. And the goal was to find a way by which, you know, these wonderful inventions could be purposed, repurposed to, you know, help people live better instead of killing people. And so the idea was to transfer the technology for nuclear power to a bunch of other countries around the world, including Iran, as it turns out, so that they would be dissuaded from wanting to develop nuclear weapons. So that this was the deal. We will give you the keys to nuclear power if you will not build nuclear weapons. Okay, that was sort of the deal they were trying to make. And so we actually went and American companies built reactors in a bunch of other countries and transferred the peaceful technology to these other countries hoping they would stay peaceful. Okay, so how does this work exactly? Well, I, I told you that you're going to be digging uranium up out of the ground in rocks, right? You're going to do uranium mining. And so then when you, when you get the uranium out of the ground, you've got to somehow turn what's normally uranium-238, which is a little tiny bit of 235, into something that is, you know, enriched in uranium-235. And so they crush the ore, they try to extract the uranium, they leave behind the radioactive waste products, um, then they treat it with sulfuric acid and they make this stuff called yellow cake, which is otherwise known as uranium oxide. And then they can turn the, the yellow cake into uranium hexafluoride gas, which they can then transport somewhere and then try to start working on that isotope ratio thing. So that's called uranium enrichment. And so remember we have to get all the way to more than 90% uranium-235 if you're gonna to try to put it in a weapon and make a nuclear explosion, make a fission weapon. But if you wanna make a power plant, you only have to enrich to about 5%, four or 5%. Okay, so that's many steps easier. And, but you still need that enriched ratio of uranium-235 compared to what you would find you know, naturally coming out of the mine. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways that people enrich the uranium isotopes. And the one I'm going to tell you a little bit about are gas centrifuges, um, because that's what's used in Iran. It's the kind of technology we found in Iraq after the first Gulf War. And uh, I won't have time to tell you about gaseous diffusion, which is what we use here, or electromagnetic magnetic isotope separation, which, much to our surprise, was uncovered um, in Iraq uh, after the, as one of their enrichment plants that we found when we were looking at their country after the first Gulf War. So I can't talk about those, but I'm going to talk about the centrifuge method. Okay, so why am I going to tell you more stuff about Iran now, today? 
Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Mideast right now, as you might have heard. And one of the things that's going on is that we are negotiating with Iran over their nuclear enrichment program. Because they've had this nuclear enrichment program going on for a long time, and we haven't really trusted them to stop at the 5% level. We think that you know, their goal is to get all the way up to the 90% level, and then they'll have the ability to build weapons, and we don't want them to do that. Okay, so there's ongoing negotiations. Um, they're having reports about it pretty much every week. Um, there's an interim agreement in place. But we're, we'd really like to get back to being better friends with Iran because right now they're supporting Iraq and Assad in Syria, who last year we didn't like, but this year we like because we're trying to combat ISIS, the folks that are running around you know, beheading journalists and taking over large swaths of Iraq and Syria. So a lot of people think that Iran is the only country that will have the the will and the ability to stop what ISIS is doing. So although we haven't been on very good terms with them for a long time, we're trying to get on better terms with them. We've had sanctions against Iran for a really long time, and part of this negotiation with their over their enrichment program involves us lessening some of the sanctions. So will we back off on their enrichment program in exchange for them helping us combat ISIS? I don't know. Or will we continue to pretend that they can do it and at the same time attacking them through cyber physical or other types of attacks? And so this is the second war and peace connection bullet that I, I said I'd talk about, this whole um, cyber security issues. So there's, and I don't know the answer to these questions, that's why I have them up here as questions. I mean, this is all happening in real time as we speak. You can pick up the newspaper pretty much any day and you'll see something about how the negotiations with Iran are going, or should we even be negotiating with them, and how can we be friends with them when we've not been friends with them for so long, and we don't trust them, and you know, on and on and on. Okay, so here's the gas centrifuge. Um, what it does, like, a set, like think merry-go-round, right? When you run a merry-go-round, things get flung to the outside, and the heavier things get flung more to the outside, right? So that's centrifugal force. And so you've got this uranium hexafluoride gas in there, and it's spinning around. And what you're trying to do is the stuff in the middle, which is the lighter weight stuff, is the 235, that's getting pulled out, and the stuff that gets flung to the outside, which is the heavier weight stuff, that's getting pulled out in a different place, right? So you're separating out the 238 from the 235. Except that it doesn't work perfectly. All you get is a little bit better fraction in the middle, and so then you take that and you put it into another centrifuge. And so you've got stages of thousands of these centrifuges that this gas goes through to eventually get your uranium-235 up to the enrichment level that you want it to get to. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. So, Iran has an extensive underground enrichment facility. Well, it has a few, but the one we're going to talk about right now is at Natanz. And most of the centrifuges are underground, um, so that you can't bomb the facility and take out their enrichment plant. And They've often stated publicly that they're really just running this to produce low enriched uranium to make the 5% that you need for the power plants, right? Because they, they need the power. They need the nuclear power somehow. They don't have any oil, except, of course, they have a lot of oil. Anyway, so, they, so they, you know, that, that's their official public um, goal for this facility. Okay, and there is a picture of an actual, I'm going to turn the light off because I can see it better. There's a picture of an actual center, center, centrifuge, and I'm an, I'm an Dinajad inspecting the IR2 model centrifuges, which were the newer ones at the plant. And so they have like thousands of these things. Okay, so now, what did we do? Well, in, two, in 2010, news reports came out 
They indicated that there was a new type of computer worm virus, malware, uh, that was discovered. And then later when people looked into that, they actually found an older one, an older version of a similar thing uh, that had actually been floating around since 2007. This thing is called Stuxnet. It was actually a really good Nova show about cybersecurity. It was just done like last week, I think. Um, about Stuxnet, which is what made me think about putting it in this talk. And so what Stuxnet did is it had to get through many different layers of computer security. First, it had to get through Windows, so it faked being a sort of trusted certificate, you know, like when it comes up and says, you know, do you want to run this program? You know, this certificate is from some trusted company and you click yes. Um, and, but then, what it did once it got into the Windows machines was it took aim at specific devices called programmable logic controllers. And not just any programmable logic controller, but specific models of these ones that were made by the Siemens company. And those ones were used to run these centrifuges, the IR1 centrifuge model. So there are the little computer brains that are telling the centrifuges how fast to spin. And now they have this computer worm in them. And and it was just like on, it's just like on this, like, um, uh, like one of these movies where the, the thieves are going in and they're trying to steal something and they change the video that the people are looking at so that the people think that nothing's happening but really they're, you know, back there carrying out their grand heist or whatever it is. So the worm was smart enough that it would actually copy the data from when the centrifuges were working properly and keep replaying that data in a loop. So all the people monitoring the centrifuges thought, oh, nothing's going on. There's nobody trying to break my centrifuges, right? The centrifuges are all working. And in reality, what the software was doing was spinning up the centrifuges to be really fast and then ramping down the centrifuges to be really slow and stressing the centrifuges so that the aluminum basically got stressed and just broke and then the centrifuges were just broken. But, but to the operators, they were like, Oh my gosh, my centrifuge just, you know, spontaneously decided to break itself, right? Because all of their data readouts looked like they were just working fine. So it's really a pretty interesting kind of um, attack. And the people that uncovered the Stuxnet it was like, you know, the people that work on the antivirus software companies, right? Like Symantec. It was actually a different company, but the Symantec people got involved. It was Kaspersky and some other folks. Um, and they were looking at this, this worm, and they couldn't, they couldn't figure out, like, oh my gosh, this thing is so clever. It, has, it is like one of the smartest virus worm things anyone's ever invented. And so they, they eventually realized this, is, this thing is so diabolical and so targeted because the only thing it affects is the preventable logic controllers in the Iranian nuclear enrichment plant, um, that it had to have been developed by a nation state. And, and later, sort of, the US, with some help from Israel, sort of fessed up in a non-public non way. But people were sort of bragging about it. Oh, look how clever we were. We were able to do this thing, and they couldn't figure it out. And just drove all the engineers crazy because their centrifuges were like blowing up for no obvious reason because they all looked like they were working. Anyway, um, so this is a, a really interesting report. I have the, um, the link at the end of this. So this one, it's about a 100 page long report that I read about Stuxnet to try to understand it better. Stuxnet will not be remembered as a significant blow against the Iranian nuclear program. In fact, it only took out about 10% of their machines, of their centrifuges, right? I mean, it caused them a lot of grief because they didn't know what was going on, and so there was lots of human capital expended, and they didn't really like to store their entire plant or anything. Um, but it is the opening act of cyber warfare in the modern age. Uh, it started as a way to combat nuclear proliferation by the Iranians, but it ended up opening up this way of attacking things that's much more difficult to control, which is the development of cyber weapons. And I was just looking at the paper this morning, and there was a big ad from Siemens Company about how they're um, providing all of the new buses or trains or something, and I'm like, you know, they're like a lot of, lot of devices now use programmable logic controllers, right? And you've got People now have figured out that 
You can attack these things. You can attack the computers that run the power grid. You can attack all these things that people weren't worried about before. So, so what's the answer? Well, it's probably not getting a, um, not going to be a technical answer. It's probably going to be a political answer. So, you know, with any luck, it's going to be some kind of agreement between people to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And uh, that is done through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, in which the big five countries, so U.S., USSR, well, Russia, China, England, France, um, say that they will not spread weapons to the other countries and they will not make any more weapons themselves. So the spreading of the weapons to the other countries is the horizontal proliferation. And the making better generations of weapons yourself is the vertical proliferation. And so we've said, we will stop making new generations of weapons and we will not spread the weapons to the other countries. And the countries that don't have them are supposed to promise not to try to acquire any weapons. And they will allow all of their peaceful nuclear power plants and nuclear enrichment plants to be inspected by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And that will hopefully stop the horizontal proliferation to the other countries. So here's the map, the most updated map I could find. Of all the countries in the world, the green ones are signed and ratified. It's like 190 countries, roughly. Um, and then Korea withdrew. That's the orange one up there. And then India, Pakistan, Israel are never signed it. Okay, so most of the countries in the world haven't back signed it. Um, except for the few that probably are trying to get nuclear weapons and don't want to sign it, right? So, um, it, it gets reviewed every five years, so we're due for another review in, uh, next year. And, right, so North Korea signed it, then withdrew, and then it started conducting nuclear tests. And Israel, India, and Pakistan still have not signed. Iran is still officially a signatory, but has been in violation for a long time. And so the International Atomic Energy Agency keeps sending inspectors over there to try to find out what they are really up to with those enrichment plants. And as of this year, the things that they're still trying to find out about are suspicious experiments. They've been running with high explosives, studies on those neutron blasters that start the weapons chains. Um, oh, I guess I repeated that one. Calculations on yields for detonations of weapons. Like, if they weren't interested in weapons, why would they be trying to calculate how to make good weapons? Okay, so right now, this negotiation thing that's going on, that I was talking about, there's an interim accord that is supposed to be getting verified through November, Thanksgiving basically. Of their stock, they have actually diluted or converted back to oxide form um, stuff they had enriched to 20%. So they're unenriching it back down to 5% from the stock. So once you're 20%, there's a few more steps to get to the 90%, but they've actually taken and they've watered it back down to get, again, to unenrich it. And if we can really be convinced that they have done that, like they say that they are doing, then we're going to be suspending the restrictions on a lot of the stuff that's been um, sanctioned against them for the past you know, decade at least, and allow people to buy their oil again, and unfreeze like $3 billion of their money that we've had frozen for a really long time in, in banks that are here. So that's what's going on right now, and you can stay tuned to see you know, what's going to happen with this treaty stuff and all of these negotiations, as well as what's going to happen with the whole thing about maybe working with them against ISIS. It'll be very interesting. But um, meanwhile, while the negotiations continue, Iran is claiming it wants to raise its low enriched uranium quantities to 190,000 units per year, whereas currently it's making 7,000. 
using its newest uh, centrifuges, the IR8 models. And they're still using the old ones, the ones that were checked by Stuxnet that didn't get blown up, to make about two and a half tons of low enriched uranium this year that hasn't been converted to anything because it's still staying at the low enriched level. We're not sure what they're going to do with all that. Um, they're making new and better models of centrifuges, IR2s all the way up through IR8s. Um, we still estimate that if they wanted to, it would take them less than two months to enrich some ur enough uranium up to the weapons grade level, the highly enriched uranium level, to make about seven bombs. Any time they would change their mind, within two months they could have seven bombs. We have no evidence that they have done that. Most of the inspections show that they have not yet done that, but it's always a worry. Okay, so not to be so totally depressing, here's a few hopeful signs to end the talk with. Um, a couple years ago, we actually signed a new treaty with Russia, back before Putin got in charge again, in which we actually limited the strategic nuclear warheads on both sides, limited the deployed weapons, intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine launch ballistic missiles, and bombs to 800. Um, so for the first time, we really are slowing the vertical proliferation like we have agreed to do for quite a long time, except we never actually did it. So we are actually backing off on the numbers of weapons that we and the Russians both have. So that's a good thing. And there was another summit held this year that since Obama took office, this is the third one now, and one every other year. This one was in The Hague and the Netherlands in uh, March. I think I forgot to fix these dates. Anyway, it was in like March or April. I, 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 sorry, I, those are probably not quite the right days. In which 58 of the world leaders, so not all 189 of them that signed the treaty, but at least 58 of them are working hard to prevent terrorists from acquiring nuclear materials that could be used for weapons, such as the highly enriched uranium and or plutonium. And also a new agreement to try to improve the security for all the radioactive waste material that's just lying around, like the stuff that comes out of hospitals and stuff that's left over from power plants that people could just be packaging up to make dirty bombs. So a dirty bomb is a bomb that's got a lot of radioactive stuff in it and it doesn't explode in a nuclear fashion with all the energy like we were talking. It just spews a bunch of garbage, radioactive garbage out and contaminates a large area but without the fireballs and the pressure waves and the mushrooms and all that. Right? It's just widespread contamination. Um, and also, you know, they're working on trying to exchange information and cooperate. So I'm, you know, so this is great. People are talking about it. People are actually paying attention to what was left over in the former USSR territories that those countries like Belarus and Ukraine don't want to deal with the stuff that was left over when they were part of the USSR. They, they don't want to be responsible for it. We're taking it away. We're cleaning it up. It's being safeguarded and, and protected so that it won't fall into the hands of terrorists. Okay, so my final words of wisdom here. You can see whether you agree with them or not, but uh, a long time ago George Washington said to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. And certainly since the, we exploded the nuclear bombs over Japan in the mid-1940s, no one has exploded any more nuclear weapons on purpose over anybody's country. So, you know, that mutually assured destruction, the fact that everyone has these nuclear arsenals, has really kept us from having any large-scale conflicts, although there have been plenty of small ones, for a really long time now. Um, you know, but finally, I, I think I personally agree with, with Albert Einstein. You cannot keep peace by force. You can only achieve peace by understanding. And so I'm hopeful if people keep talking to each other, if they work together to try to <coughs> rein in the spread of nuclear materials, try to get a handle on the whole terrorism thing, that, you know, maybe someday we'll have go back to having peace everywhere in the world. And here's some some of the references that you might find interesting. And I'll give these slides to uh, Tim to post because they're very different than previous years. There's a bunch of material here, so.
to have them. And so I'm going to conclude. So Professor Kaminsky talked with us about a lot of different ideas about uh, the making of weapons, the monitoring of how they might be produced. Uh, what do you guys <coughs> want to ask her about that in terms of uh, thinking about the future? I have a comment and a question. So the first comment is that two weeks ago, Obama announced he was asking for $1 trillion to modernize the nuclear weapons yes. And then the question is, is it possible to create an EMP pulse about Okay, so the comment was Obama announced he's asking for a trillion dollars to modernize our nuclear weapons arsenal. Okay, good luck getting that. Um, <laughs> so, considering that nothing he's asked for has been approved lately. Um, can you modernize an arsenal without actually developing new weapons? Well, a lot of the work that's been that I understand uh, that has been gone, going on at Livermore for a while with the National Ignition Facility. That's a way of determining stockpile reliability and how well the stuff is going to work without actually having any explosions. I'm not exactly sure how they do that because, as I said, I don't know anything classified. But um, that's the whole stockpile readiness, stockpile uh, testing, modeling, that kind of thing could cost money. That's a whole lot of money to spend if you're not going to be developing a new kind of weapon. So that would pretty much, if you know, they were going to spend money like that, you'd think they would be vertically proliferating again, which is something we said we weren't going to do. So that would be bad, in my opinion. Can you create an electromagnetic pulse without exploding a nuclear weapon? Not to my knowledge, but I could be wrong. Because um, it, it's really, you need to be able, I mean, you can make, you can ionize the atmosphere without exploding a weapon. Storms do that, right? You could shoot big currents through the atmosphere yourself, you know, without making an explosion, but it, it wouldn't have that sort of all encompassing spherical shape that would take out large areas. That would be my best guess about that. Um, can you explain more what a dirty bomb is? Okay, can I explain more what a dirty bomb is? So, you know, have you ever been to a hospital and gotten like a Varian GI series done or anything like that? You know, hospitals in a lot of places use radioactive things, right, to trace, look at your insides. Um, nuclear power plants have a lot of low-level radioactive waste that are left over. So imagine somebody got a hold of like the garbage from the hospitals, you know, from, for quite a while and just put it inside the regular bomb and then blew it up. Right, those the radioactive materials would not get be would not be destroyed by that chemical explosion. They would just be dispersed, right? So then you'd have a whole bunch of radioactive stuff, just like on the ground, and, you know, in the air, and radioactive atoms in the air. And so it's you know it's dirty, but it doesn't. It's still a regular kind of bomb, so it isn't going to kill a hundred thousand people all at once. It just makes a big super fun cleanup site. Right? And maybe some of the people that breathed the air that had the radioactive particles in them 20 years later would die of cancer or something. So, you know, their, their acts of um, mass terror as opposed to mass destruction. Right? Everybody would be totally freaked out because all of a sudden, you know, you walk outside and there's like big caution signs and it's a big contaminated area, right? But not a lot of people died. Just the normal number of people when you blow up a normal bomb. What level of do you believe North Korea has with its nuclear Okay, so the question is, what level of threat do I believe North Korea has? <coughs> okay, so they've conducted a couple of successful nuclear tests for small weapons, but just being able to blow something up under the ground doesn't mean that they can actually get it anywhere and have it do it somewhere else. So you need to have a delivery system, you need to have missiles that you can fire you know, far distances if you're going to threaten somebody. And so far, most of their, um, anything, any kind of missile they've tried to build that was bigger than a short-range missile has mostly not worked, although they're getting better at making the missiles. So now they can maybe make medium-range missiles and so they can get to their neighboring countries. They're not capable at this time of making intercontinental missiles that could get all the way to the U.S. or someplace like that. Um, 
it's a very impoverished country and they're spending a lot of money doing that to just show how you know powerful they are but um, it's you know I don't other than in their region like to South Korea or the neighboring countries I don't think they're much of a threat to the US personally at least not yeah it's not to say it was great that they did that you know it's not good when anybody learns how to do that and you didn't really want them to especially in an unstable country like that yes Okay, so is nuclear power as clean and efficient, oh, as, clean and efficient as they say it is? Yeah. So is it like worth the effort and trouble that people go through? Or okay, is it worth the trouble? Well, that really sort of depends on how you rate global climate change as a threat versus how you rate uh, the radioactive byproducts that are left over from the power plants as a threat. Right, so you're much. You guys are much younger than I am. You're going to live long enough to be really feeling the effects of climate change. Um, nuclear power right now, besides renewables, which can't really account for that much of the total energy needs of our country, nuclear power right now is the only carbon neutral kind of power source that there is. And so, a lot of people that are very threatened by uh, global climate change are pushing for more nuclear power and figuring. They'll learn how to deal with the wastes, you know, later at some point. Well, we still really don't know how to deal with the wastes from the ones that we've had going for quite a long time. I do believe that the plants can be made pretty safe, just because some countries have some problems with an occasional power plant. Um, doesn't, doesn't obviate the fact that you've got people dying from working in coal plants, you've got people, you know, <coughs> dying from the air pollution, from fossil, fossil fuel burning plants. I mean, you know, nothing is entirely clean, right? There is no really good plan for what to do with all the nuclear waste from the power plants. Most of it's just stored in big vats right on site because they don't know where to put it. This country has been looking for a place to put that stuff for quite a while. They thought they had a place in a uh, waste isolation pilot plant. And then that state, I think it was Nevada, said, I don't know, we don't want don't want you to put the stuff there, and then they discovered it wasn't maybe as geologically stable as they thought, and so it's still a problem what to do with the waste. Um, that being said, there's some countries like France that have been getting 80% of their power or some really large number like that from nuclear power and not having any accidents. So we could do that, but in this country everyone's too afraid of it to even build any new ones at all, even if it would give us a reliable source of power that would not contribute to the carbon loading problem. So that, that's a choice you all are going to have to make in the future. Uh, do you think the U.S. should support uh, Iran Train enrichment programs in exchange for helping size no, I don't know about that. So do, the question is, do I think we should support their enrichment program in exchange for their help against ISIS? You know, I really don't know. That's that's like a political question, and I'm a physicist. I'm not a politician, so that's that's just really that's just really tough. Um, I have been around long enough to see Iran behave really badly in a lot of situations. So, I personally, I don't think I would trust them. Um, but you know, trust but verify. If we could really inspect all their stuff enough to know what they were really doing. But the inspectors have been having troubles, as I was sort of indicating, getting the access and really being convinced that they're being shown the truth. So, you know, I don't know. The ISIS thing is a, is a big problem. I really don't have any good solutions for that at all. It's really a political thing. Any more questions? So we can yeah. All right. So what's my what's my position on China in terms of its technological leadership? I'd say that um, the people of China should be demanding air that they can breathe, and uh, you know they're building power plants and opening them up like every day, like coal coal burning power plants. But 
at a certain point, they're just going to choke their entire economy because nobody will be able to breathe, and then they're going to have to do something different. And I think they're sort of starting to do stuff that's different, but, you know, it's really hard for us in our position of privilege here in the U.S. to say to developing countries, you shouldn't want to be like us. You, you don't need to have cars. You need to have air conditioning. You, know, you don't need to have all the things that we assume that, that everybody should have in this country. I'm sorry, I'm going to my question. What I mean is they've been known to export this technology to less than third world countries. Right, so China has been known to export nuclear technology to less than third world countries, as has Russia. Yes. As has, you know, other places, Pakistan, right? And almost all the, Iran, uh, all the Iranian uh, enrichment plant designs came from um, this famous guy, A.Q. Khan, from Pakistan. So, you know, I think you just have to try to verify. You just have to build relationships where you can trust the people and check on them. I mean, I don't know any better way to do it. You're not going to be able to keep people from selling arms to other countries. Certainly, we... This country sells more than its share of arms to all the other countries. Which one would you say would have the worst uh, aftermath of fusion weapon or a fission weapon? Okay, so fusion weapons are more powerful, but actually most of the modern day weapons are a combination of things like a fission boosted fusion weapon or you know, they have like a couple different kinds of techniques going on. But the, the fusion weapons are I mean the reason they went on to develop them is they are actually more powerful. Okay, well then thank you very much. I'll turn